Good morning. morning. Welcome to Worship on the Lord's Day. It is such a joy to gather as the family of faith to be invited into God's presence, to be promised that God is present with us, that God's Spirit indwells us, that God's truth is relevant for our lives. And that's what we seek. We seek God's truth to be relevant for our lives, uh, to lead us and guide us each and every day. And so we come to God's Word uh, seeking that. Uh, Before we do that, let me introduce what we're doing. We're starting a new sermon series. Uh, This is a sermon series I entitled, Living Your Life with Jesus. It's pretty simple and straightforward, because isn't that what we're called to do as followers of Christ? To live our life with Jesus. It's not, we don't segment our lives to a Sunday morning. We live each and every day with Jesus. Hopefully, as you entered this morning, you received a bookmark that we made for you. This is a bookmark uh, that basically has six different kind of steps Six different marks of spirituality, practices, disciplines, call it what you will. Six ideas that we're going to explore about how to live our life with Jesus. And and each Sunday for six weeks, you see the sermon title and the theme we're going to uh, explore together. Live simply, that's what we'll talk about today. Love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily and leave everything else to Jesus Christ. We're going to unpack that for the next six weeks. This is for you to place in your Bible or maybe to put on your refrigerator with a magnet over it or somewhere that's helpful for you as we think about embedding this in our identity and in our life as we live with Jesus each and every day. Also, I'm going to ask that you keep this handy. At the end of the service, since we all have it, we're going to share this as a benediction together. I'm going to do this for the next six weeks, this very benediction. But today, since you have it, we're going to give one another the benediction using this, so keep it handy. Today we are studying in the the book of Micah. Now Micah, uh, just so you know, if you were looking for it, is right behind Nahum. It helps you, doesn't it? Yeah. Nahum's about two pages long, so... Uh, But we're going to Micah. And what's interesting about the book of Micah, Micah was in the 8th century. He was what we call one of the minor prophets. Doesn't mean that he was small, but he came in the earliest days of Israel, before Jerusalem had fallen, before they had been taken captive in Babylon, before things really fell apart. He was one of the first voices shooting a flare across the bow saying, Hey guys, listen. Remember, remember how you were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? Remember how God rescued you? God did that for a purpose. And you're not living into your purpose. You're, you're basically living just like your, your pagan neighbors. And he began to address some of the kinds of injustices that were happening. The powerful were oppressing the powerless. Laborers were being, laborers were being exploited. Uh, courts were corrupt. And... Uh, the middle class was, um, was being reduced to poverty by the wealthy class. And while all this was happening, by the people of God to one another, the, the, many people were streaming to the temple with lavish offerings to offering in the, offer in the temple on the altar of God. And so they thronged to offer these gifts while they lacked the moral and the loving spirit toward God and toward one another. And so Micah comes as the mouthpiece of God to say, hey, listen, you're being hypocrites. You're being hypocrites. It's it's not about what you give to make up for what you are not in who you are. And so he gets their attention, he gets our attention as we think about this theme of living simply. In the sixth chapter of Micah, we hear our text. It's, this is a very familiar passage to many of us. And it's a rhetorical question that's really asked. Now think about the context I just shared with you. With what shall I come before the Lord? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, in other words, the very finest? Uh, shall I come before Him uh, with... Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? You see what's going on here. They're really inflating this. You know, can I impress God? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? A little bit of hyperbole going on there. Giving one's own child. And then here comes the answer to the rhetorical question. And, and maybe the person calling uh, can give us the answer as well. 
Or maybe you should give them this answer. In verse 8, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in it. We pray that it would come alive to us now as never before. Through the power of your spirit, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love hearing your stories and, and hearing about so many of you who've come back from the north. Every week there are more that come back from the north. And, 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 and you all flock back, and we who live here year-round live here for a very good reason that I don't need, it's not new news to you this time of year, is it? I mean, the weather's incredible. Where we live is paradise. Everywhere we go, there's water. It, you know, we can go out in short sleeves most of the time. It's just gorgeous. And if you're like me, you know, you drive around and you, you see the gorgeous views. Uh, I took a picture coming over the bridge this morning of the sunrise and sent it to my son in Washington, D.C. just to kind of jab him a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's 72 degrees here. Yeah. One of my favorite things is uh, just the marine atmosphere. You know, I'm a surfer. I love the ocean. I love boats. I love sailboats. I can remember years back, I was living up in North Florida and I had the same experience going over a bridge. There was a little marina nearby and, and I always served churches that had preschools. So I had the honor and privilege of taking my, my two youngest uh, to preschool with me to church, to, to work, to, to work basically. And so it was our routine every day and We'd drive over the bridge, and I'd look out over the marina and this beautiful vista and the water and the sailboats. And in this marina, there happened to be one cabin cruiser that was sort of to the left of the marina that was half sunken. It's kind of interesting. But I'd always, always look out and say to my kids as we're going over the bridge, Hey, look, kids, there's my boat. When are you going to bring me my boat? And they'd laugh. And then after a while, we'd do this routine. Hey, there's my boat. When are you going to bring me my boat? And uh, they began to say, well, Dad, uh, they were three and five years old, okay. Uh, Dad, we can't swim. <laughs> we can't bring you your boat. So the routine went on, and one day I said, hey, there's my boat. My daughter, who was the five-year-old, uh, began to get a little clever. And she said, Dad, you're just dreaming. <laughs> and then she went from cleverness to a bit of sarcasm, and she said, Dad, yours is the sunken boat right over there. <laughs> what's going on here with this whole community of Israel that Micah is addressing is their boat is sinking. They've lost the dream. The dream that gave them birth. Their identity, their focus, their life, blood was the redemption of God and why they were rescued in the first place. They've lost sight of it. They've lost sight of it. And Micah comes with these few words, he has told you, O mortals, in other words, this is not new news. I'm not coming to tell you something you don't already know. Isn't that the case for us often in the Christian life? It's not that we're always learning something new. Sometimes we need to be reminded of something that's old that we know that has fallen to the wayside for us. And so we see this vision that he's resurrecting that God has for their life. This vision of the people of God streaming to the mountain of God, Mount Moriah. It is to be the, the mountain above all mountains. There's something symbolic about that image, by the way. That God's mountain in your life should be higher than all the other mountains. You know, we have a lot of mountains that stand in our way. But God's is the peak that towers over all the others. In, in the fourth chapter, we see a little bit of a summation of what Micah is getting at with the sixth chapter, when he, when he says these familiar words in the fourth chapter, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. He's, he's talking about using swords for plowshares as an image of taking a, a life-taking tool and making it a life-giving tool. And what he's doing here is very symbolic. It's a thread that's woven all throughout the Old and the New Testament. And we see the crescendo of it with, uh, with Jesus on the cross, don't we? I mean, what better example of taking a death-dealing tool and making it a life-giving tool? Jesus 
turn the tool of violence into a life-giving tool. And so Micah is starting out with that vision for them, for their life. And he's saying, you are to be life-giving, not life-absorbing. And, and Jesus, in, in Luke, where he speaking to his followers in Luke chapter 9, he basically uses that same image. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we see that Luke, uh, Jesus says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. In other words, this is a lifestyle thing that he's talking about. This is about molding and shaping your life on a daily basis to be life-giving in the way of the cross. And he's echoing what Micah began to say to the people of Israel. Jesus gave his life for us, gave his life for others, and so we are to be life-giving to others as well. God wants you and me to live life God's way, which is a life-giving way. Now let's talk about some brass tacks, just to, just to start out. Yesterday, we were driving up US-1 after our congregational summit, and, um, and we see this car starting to turn. It's turning slowly, more slowly than the person in the lane next to us that was behind them wanted, obviously, because it was the familiar sound. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, maybe she's pregnant in the car behind them. Maybe they're bleeding. They need an ambulance. Something really important for them to honk their horn like that and then speed past them. And as we caught up with them, they turned into the Thai restaurant. We saw them get out and walk into the restaurant. Really? Here's a rule of thumb. Treat strangers like they're your mother. And you'll be life-giving to strangers. Treat them like they're your mother. Now, I hope that is a good thing for most of you, but your moms, uh, it's meant to be. <laughs> if you don't have a good relationship with your mom, forget that advice. Generally speaking, treat people in a life-giving way. Uh, what does it mean to be life-giving? I mean, it's, it's relationship to strangers. It's a relationship to the environment around us. I'm, you know, I, I'm at the beach very often. I'm always amazed at the amount of pollution on the beach. It, it, it's just disturbing that a civilized people do that. Uh, you know, I went out and rescued a turtle in our backyard in the river. I thought it was alive and got out in my kayak and this turtle was dead, floating on the surface because it had been caught up in all kinds of trash and it drowned the turtle. It, what does it mean to be life-giving people in our world? I mean, it has real practical implications for all creatures, all people. Uh, part, of, part of what it means, I think, is, is to uh, not isolate ourselves from people who have need. Not, we live in such a privileged area, such a, a, a fairly insulated area. And so it's really important for us to expose ourselves to others. I'll never forget one of the, one of the most incredible gifts I'd ever experienced in this way. Years ago, serving a church up in Jacksonville, uh, we went to serve at a soup kitchen. It was more than a soup kitchen. It was called the City Rescue Mission. This was a big outfit that really served as a rehab center for homeless people who were also addicts. And you had to commit to the full program. It was, it was intellectual training, school, you know, scholastic training. It was emotional. It was spiritual. They had to work. They had all kinds of accountability. It was a very, very serious deal. And it wasn't just the opportunity to go and serve them with a group of people. And I took my oldest son, who's now 19, he was 11 years old at that time. I'll never forget the incredible value of doing that. Not only did we serve, but we sat down and we ate lunch with them. And in sitting around the table, it was a God moment. There was this guy who began telling a story. Now, I have my 11-year-old son right there. And he says, you know, I was a, I was a chef. A world class chef for the National Basketball Association. Made it big in my career. Millionaire. Well, and it all went to pot, as fame and fortune can do to some, and he lost it all. He became an addict. He became nothing. And he found himself at that rehab center. And he said these words to my son that are golden. He said to him, this 11-year-old child, 
You know, son, my abilities took me to where my character could not keep me. I want you to think about those words coming from a homeless man who's an addict. If you or I had said that to him, it wouldn't be nearly as powerful as him sitting in the presence of this addict seeking help, homeless saying it to him, purposely exposing him, being life-giving to my son. It became life-giving for us and for him. That's a lesson none of us could ever contrive without that scenario. What does it mean to be life-giving? Uh, part of what it means, and this is really practical stuff, I mean, for, for so many of us, it means not maxing out our schedules and missing opportunities to serve, like I just described. Because you have, you have no idea what God might have waiting for you. But so often we overload our schedules, we obligate ourselves in so many ways with so many different things that we just, we miss out on life-giving opportunities. John Seren was asked why when so many people seek to be godly, in God's eyes, there are so few who are truly saintly. And he said this, sobering words. He said, the chief reason is that they give too big a place in life to indifferent things. Too big a place in life to indifferent things. I think that's often the case. I mean, it's a spiritual act to prioritize our calendars. And what is most important? What about your daily and weekly and monthly activities is truly eternal in nature? Is truly redemptive in nature? That's a spiritual discipline just to look at our obligations and our calendars. It's living a life-giving way. In, in so doing, part of what that means is seeing people as Jesus sees people. When you stand in the line to get coffee at the coffee cafe or at the grocery store or you're in some line somewhere, how do you see the people in front of you? Do you see them as impediments to you getting your purchase accomplished? Or do you see them as individual children of God who have deep soul longings, who have deep spiritual needs, emotional needs? You see the difference there? There's a huge difference. You've heard me tell the story, I believe, about Re Rebecca Pippert being in the O'Hare airport and a woman dumping her purse accidentally out in front of her. And Rebecca, she's on her way to her gate, but she decides to stop and help this lady. And the woman begins to ask her, a complete stranger, 10 o'clock in the morning, where she could find the bar. Rebecca huh, shakes her head. She accompanies her. Because she reflects on that, and she says... People like her are put there as divine appointments in our lives. The people in your life are not there by accident. They are encounters that God has prearranged for you to be life-giving, to see them as Jesus sees them. The irony is that it comes back as life-giving for us when we put ourselves in those situations intentionally as well as spontaneously. Part of what this implies is having a God consciousness about everything that we do. A lot of times we kind of put God and our spiritual life into a little cubby hole. It fits, there's a spiritual life over here, then there's the rest of my life over here. Uh, to quote Rob Bell, everything is spiritual because God created everything about your life, is behind everything in your life. Frank Laubach, Frank Laubach uh, had this journal that he was keeping and, and he had this curious thing that was notated at the top corner of every page. His children, after his death, found his journal and began to see it and try to make sense of what it was about. He would have on one page, conscious, he would write, conscious, 80%. The next page, conscious, 25%. The next page, conscious, 50%. As they read on, they began to realize that what he was doing was what is called a game with minutes. At the end of each day, he would reflect back on his day and he would try to assess how conscious he was of God's presence throughout that day as a way of thinking about that day and preparing for the next. That's being intentional about God's, being God conscious, about being life giving, looking for ways to bring Christ's light to others, looking for ways to let the life giving Spirit of God use you. Israel, they fell into a trap, didn't they? They fell into the trap of living lives of indifference, much like their pagan neighbors, living lives for themselves. They fell into the trap of living life-absorbing lives instead of life-giving lives. A 
And God always wants to turn self-focused lives into lives of justice and compassion. That's a part of what it means to be life-giving. And Micah uses those words, loving justice and uh, doing justice and loving kindness. It starts with how, caring for how we impact others that are immediately around us. And even globally, having, having concern about our global impact. Do you know that the United States, which makes up 6% of the world's population, consumes 33% of the world's resources? Now, I can't give you a suggestion for how we can walk out of here today and make a real difference in that way, but as Christians, we should care. We care about our impact physically and locally as well as globally. Do justice and love kindness, says Micah. That word for kindness in Hebrew is chesed. Chesed means a kind of loyal love, a mercy, a compassion. Compassion is the word in English that probably most closely characterizes what he's getting at. What would it be like? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would be like if we lived in a world where everyone loved kindness? I mean, there was just a genuine heartfelt love of kindness. Uh, what would life be like if everyone was life-giving in the way we're talking about? That's God's vision. This notion of kindness or compassion is God. God's vision is not complicated. We often make it more complicated. And Micah, what's beautiful about what he says is he just kind of whittles it down. He's trying to offer, as we think about simple living, a simpler spirituality. The idea of advocating justice and offering compassion. Yesterday we went to the, uh, the uh, Port Salerno uh, Festival, the seafood festival. A lot of fun. And there are a lot of booths around, one of which is one of these booths, they asked us to sign a petition for you know, saving our river and all, all that is an, sort of an ongoing effort in our community. And of course, you know, we signed it and, and, and I began to think about that. You know, that is a spiritual act of justice. That's an act of justice. And as Christians, we frame it that way. We think about it that way. We do it from that motive, that orientation. Thursday, I was over at the Homework Angels. We had this wonderful tutoring ministry every Tuesday and Thursday. We had 22 children from our community, largely Hispanic children whose parents don't know English. And so we gather them together and tutor them to help them with their homework because their parents are not able to help them. A wonderful ministry. You're invited to be a part of it. And as I'm looking at all of our volunteers who are serving in that wonderful ministry, I'm thinking, that is compassion. Kudos. That is enfleshing compassion in our midst. Those children need this. They need you. They need the love of Christ in that way. But you see, with all that I'm saying, the goal really is to clear away distractions, to shape lifestyles that free us to do justice and to be compassionate with others, to clear away distractions from living a life-giving life. Make it possible for you and for your family to concentrate your energy and to focus on the stuff that matters to God, that God cares about. Remember, remember the story Jesus tells about Mary and Martha? You know the story in Luke chapter 10. Martha is busy uh, preparing the meal. And she thinks she's doing the right thing. And she begins, to, so much so, she begins to complain to Jesus because Mary's sitting there doing nothing. And she says, Jesus... Look at me. I'm busy making you dinner. Tell Mary to help me. But what does Jesus say to her? Let me quote it in Luke chapter 10. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken from her. Martha, you're distracted. Distraction is one of our spiritual enemies. It really is. Martha scurries. Mary is focused. There's a lesson in there for us about simpler living, a simpler spirituality. Often, the tyranny of the urgent obscures the call of the important. Let me say that again. I want you to hear it. The tyranny of the urgent obscures the call of the important. I think that applies to me, to you, and to so many of us who try to follow Christ. Often the problem, 
another problem for us is that we create a kind of artificial dichotomy between justice and compassion. We kind of polarize and politicize it sometimes, don't we? Oh, justice is for sort of uh, conservatives and compassion for bleeding heart liberals, and we put them in different camps. But listen, <laughs> we are to reflect the character of God, not the agenda of political parties. We, we as God's children are defined by the God of the cross, Jesus Christ, not man-made institutions or ideologies. It's all the above, not one or the other. Sometimes we go to these extremes. I call them the extremes of rigid spirituality or of loose spirituality. You've seen people like this, haven't you? The people that are really rigid, that are really justice-oriented, they really, boy, they measure everything. And sometimes they can be really, really uptight, right? And then there's the other extreme of people that are really loosey-goosey, compassionate, and there's sort of no boundaries to their spirituality, and it's just kind of anything goes, right? What I want to suggest, the Bible points us toward, Micah points us toward, Jesus points us toward, is what we might call lordship spirituality. Lordship spirituality. Recognizing that Jesus is Lord over all, and we follow him. Graham Scroge was preaching a sermon, and uh, he was preaching about lordship spirituality. At the end of his sermon, a young lady got up. She was really moved by his sermon. And, but she came forward, and she said, I have a problem. Tears are streaming down her eyes. She said, I just, I hear what you're saying about acknowledging Jesus as Lord over my life, Lord of all of my life, but I just don't, I'm afraid I can't do it. I'm afraid I can't do what he asks me to do. Be who he asks me to be. So as he's listening to her, Graham Scroge opens his Bible to Acts, the book of Acts. Remember the passage about Peter having a dream? And in the dream, God is lowering down a sheet full, full of animals that were unclean, that, that Jews were not to eat. And in the dream, Jesus is telling Peter, take kill and eat. And Peter responds, no, Lord. Jesus repeats, take, kill, and eat. No, Lord. Three times, no, Lord. Until he realizes, this is really, this is really Jesus telling me to do this. And he relents. So, Scroge takes this passage with the open Bible, and he puts it in this young lady's lap, and he gives her a pen. And he says, you can say no, or you can say Lord. But what you can't do, ever, is say no, Lord. Now take this pen and choose which word you will mark out for yourself. And he walked away. He gave her a moment. He prayed for her. And as he came back, he looked over her shoulder, and he could see that she had, with the pen, marked out no, no, no. And he could hear her sobbing, saying, you are Lord Jesus. You are my Lord. Guys, that's what it's about. That's, that's a simple spirituality. That's living simply. And so when Micah comes and he asks this rhetorical question, with what shall I come to the Lord? Shall I come with a young calf with thousands of rams and rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn? Which, as I said, is hyperbole because he knew there was a prohibition against child sacrifice that was being done by the pagans. No. What does God want? Well, St. Augustine has a great answer. St. Augustine said, you ask what you should offer, offer yourself. Offer yourself. God doesn't want your stuff. God wants, God needs no thing. God wants you, all of you. That's why Paul in chapter 12 of Romans says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters. He's just pleading with them. Offer yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to the Lord. Don't bring other stuff thinking that that will be a substitute. God wants nothing but you. God wants people who live and think and act a certain way. God is a God of justice and compassion. And God wants people who reflect his character, who walk humbly with him. That, that phrase, walk humbly, we could translate walk carefully. To carefully plot out your life. And so the focus, 
The focus of all this, very simply, is to live with God and to live for others. To live with God and to live for others. That's what it means to walk humbly. The 12th or the 4th century, Ambrose of Milan, Italy, was a bishop. And he had this, this wonderful question that he asked in a sermon, and I'll ask you. He said, you have learned the method of your flight from here. Why do you delay? Isn't that the question for us that Micah puts in front of us? We're called to live simpler lives, life-giving lives, by the way of Christ and his cross. Let's pray together. We thank you for the vision of God that you give us, for the power that you give us in your spirit to live as your children. Help us. Help us in our inability to do so. Make us life givers and so to be given life that you might be given all the honor and glory and praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Today is a special Sunday for several different reasons. It is the tradition, the custom of our congregation to uh, recognize the service and to celebrate the service of so many in our midst. Uh, I'm going to ask Kurt Quinter to come forward. He's uh, the vice president of our congregation. He's going to assist me here in a moment. But let me take the privilege of of pointing out to you that we have an insert in our bulletin with the names of so many of you who, uh, who have served in the last year in life-giving ways, in the ways that we've been talking about this morning. You know the church is not a building, right? You know the church is not an institution. The church is the people. You are the church, and the people make God's vision come alive, God's mission come alive. It is because of you, so many of you who have given of your time, of your effort, your talents, and your gifts, that we've been able to serve as we have and to celebrate what God has done in the last year. I want to thank you as a pastor, as a fellow parishioner, uh, as, as one who thinks that the, the best, most important thing we can do in life is serve God. And you've been a part of that. We, we wish we could give gin, ginormous, you know, Grammy-like trophies out to everybody. Um, but short of that, what we have for you are uh, chip clips. Yeah, chip clips. Uh, and they have our, our church name on them. And we have a basket. We want you to grab a chip clip as you leave. Now, there's something kind of symbolic about a chip clip. Think about it. They're kind of mundane, aren't they? But you need them every single day. They're really, they're, they're really simple, but they perform a very important task. So do you. And I want to thank you. And we thank you uh, for being such an important part of uh, keeping God's work alive in our community through Stewart Congregational Church. This morning at the 8 o'clock service, we also had the privilege of uh, recognizing in a special way what we call uh, faithful servants that kind of rise above uh, the crop. And um, we gave a, a little plaque that you may have seen uh, to Ned and Marion Hughes who have served so faithfully in so many ways. And there are so many that are so deserving of that kind of recognition. And so we are grateful, uh, grateful for all of you. It is fitting, as we have our celebration of service, that we also recognize, ordain, and install deacons. And uh, at this time, I'm going to ask for those who are part of our, who've been elected to be a deacon, to come forward at this time. Deacons are those who are elected to serve in uh, various capacities in our midst, to serve those who are in need. And uh, these are some of those who we have, who you all have elected. Trish Smith, who serves as the president of our deacons. Bobby Kaufman, John Fuchs, uh, Karen Gianfortone, uh, Kathy Sue Tranter, uh, Debbie Kinnett, Lee Merrick, Mike Bursick, Audrey Potter, Susan Moore, Joe Rush and Sandra Nelson. I'm going to ask if you would, if you would stand on the platform facing the congregation as we go forward. The Apostle Paul had a lot to say about officers in the church, and he 
He saw officers in the church as those who set the example of leadership. And so in 1 Timothy, we read these words, Deacons, likewise, must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them first be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. And so we know that your role is of primary importance as leaders of our congregation. And as you are ordained and installed today, we'd like to ask that you would affirm the following questions. These are covenant questions. As deacons of the Stuart Congregational Church, please affirm your covenant bond with us by answering the following questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the Church, universal, and God's Word to you? Do you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture? Will you? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. And finally, will you set a Christ-like example of leadership for your congregation, always offering a kind word, seeking reconciliation, and the goodwill of others? Will you? God bless you in your ministry with us, among us, and beyond us. Amen and amen. Kurt? Brothers and sisters of our faith family, please affirm your covenant bond with our deacons by answering the following questions with response, we will. Do we, the members of the church, accept these parishioners as deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to encourage them, pray for them, to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. We will be faithful, will we be faithful in our support of the deacons and care ministries, assisting and participating as we are able to the best of our ability. God bless us in our ministry with our deacons and may God be given the honor and glory through the covenants we have made this day. Amen and amen. amen. We're going to pause for a moment of prayer and ordination. I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads and that the deacons do so as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for calling people, as in deacons, to be your servants, to represent you, to be those who represent your grace who lead in the way of Christ, to be those who serve the needy, who quicken us to the needs of those in our midst and in our community. We pray for your spirit to fall upon them. We pray for your grace to fill them. We pray that their identity might be found in you and in you alone. We pray for their leadership, for their energy, for their creativity and imagination, and that you, O oh God, would be Lord of their life, Lord of their ministry. We pray that you would ordain them as only you can do by the power of your Spirit. We thank you for calling them and for calling all of us into lives that are intertwined with you and your will. And as we ordain and install these deacons, Lord, we symbolically together bring before you the needs of our community. We pray for Trudy Burrow, a friend of Jerry Hill who has just been put in hospice in Michigan. 
We pray for your love and care and grace to be with that friend of Jerry's. Lord, we pray for Hal Cleaver, for quick recovery while he is in Martin North from whatever his illness or ailment might be, O oh God. Be with him and heal him. We pray for Barbara Bernstein, who fractured some vertebrae, O oh God. We pray for healing without complication, that you would be the great physician for her. Lord, we pray for all who are serving our country, who are in harm's way. We pray for safety, first of all, that you would bring them home and that peace would prevail. And we give you thanks for Todd, for Todd Johnson, and for his return. Lord, we thank you for Gladys and her safekeeping in her accident. Keep her safe. Calm her mind and her nerves as she continues to drive. Lord, we lift up Pete Hickman, who is having an operation and, uh, on his shoulder. And we pray, O oh God, that it would be successful, that it might be one that brings healing to his arm. And for Esther Williams, who suffered a, a heart attack and needed to have bypass surgery, we pray for her quick recovery from her triple bypass. Lord, be with these that we mention, and especially those we don't mention, the many in our own lives and in this world who don't have someone to pray for them, who go unnoticed, but we know you know them and their need, and we lift them to you. Thank you for our deacons, for those who serve so well in our midst. Thank you for hearing our prayers, and for hearing us now as we pray like Jesus taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.